Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, A Deep Dive into Citrix, How Desktop as a Service and NetScaler Can Work for Your Business. We have a lot of great stuff to cover today, but before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. First, we'll aim to run about 45 minutes with a few minutes for questions at the end. This webinar is being recorded and you'll get a copy of the recording and the slides after the event. And lastly, attendees are in listen only mode, but I encourage you to put your questions into the Q&A function as we go and we will get to those at the end. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our panel for today. First, we have JP Alfaro joining us from Citrix, where he is a principal account technical strategist. Then we have Scott Greathouse, our senior director of service delivery at Dataprize, and Robert Williams, a cloud architect at Dataprize. Lastly, my name is Stephanie Hamrick. I am a marketing manager at Dataprize, and I will be your monitor, moderator for today. Next, I'll give a quick intro on Dataprize for those who don't know us, and then I'll hand it over to JP to talk a little bit about Citrix. So Dataprize is a national managed services provider. We have been providing services end-to-end -end for our clients across the United States since 1995. We believe technology should enable you to be the best at what you do, and so we deliver our best-in-class managed services, data protection, cybersecurity, network infrastructure, collaboration, and end-user solutions to help you get there. And I'll hand it over to JP for a moment to tell us a little bit more about Citrix. Thank you, Stephanie, and hello, everybody. Uh, so as you know, at Citrix, we have been around for a little over two decades. We're a recognized leader in the desktop as a service and uh, app and desktop virtualization markets, and also on the application delivery controller market through our NetScaler product. Uh, we support over 400,000 customers uh, all around the world. and. Uh, a little over two years ago, we were actually acquired and taken private to become part of Cloud Software Group. Citrix is a business unit within Cloud Software Group, and our focus is to work with partners like Dataprize so that we can solve their customer requirements. So uh, know that when we're working with a partner like Dataprize, we're taking your customer requirements, your uh, needs from a service, service perspective uh, in consideration when developing our products. Awesome. Now, let me share a little bit about what is in store. So first, we're going to cover the recent changes to the Citrix licensing model and tell you what they mean for you. Then we'll discuss some new Citrix features and we'll see a demo of some of those, which is going to be pretty cool. Third, we will cover some common Citrix questions we get as a Citrix partner. And lastly, we will wrap up with some key takeaways. So with that, we'll get into our first big section, which is a deep dive into the Citrix universal licensing changes. JP, do you want to tell us a little bit about this new model and what it means for customers? Yep, absolutely. So what we're doing with Citrix universal license is that we wanted to bring both partners and customers equally the stability of a committed model that they could predict predictably work under simplicity taking it uh, from over a thousand SKUs to just two SKUs then bundle all of our uh, features uh, for uh, both partners and customers to take advantage of and then the value that you get from those features that provides increased uh, capacity and capability now this is definitely about added value and not higher price the idea is that you get more more capacity more capabilities because you're getting all premium licensing across the board, more licensing. Uh, this brings you the opportunity to consolidate uh, multiple vendor licenses into a single vendor through data price. So if you have some services, let's say in F5 or VMware, you can consolidate that, all of that um, uh, through data price via Citrix. And of course, you can also explore new capabilities uh, with a powerful NetScaler capacity and capability that's been uh, embedded into Universal. Now, 
Uh, the universal license is pretty much a bundle of, of different uh, flavors or, or umbrellas, if you will, uh, that provide you different uh, capabilities. So on uh, the Citrix side, the licensing model is per user, and this lets you leverage both Citrix DAS and Citrix virtual apps and desktops. Was What that means is that data, data price can enable your users to leverage both desktops and applications coming from virtual apps and desktops and Citrix DAS as well as Citrix endpoint management. So it, endpoint management used to be a completely separate service. Now it's just another feature embedded into Universal. On the Netscaler side, you get the flex model. And with this, everything is premium across the board, meaning you have access to all of the Netscaler capabilities, not only on a virtual apps and desktops perspective, but also on the application delivery controller side, um, uh, load balancing, web application protection, et cetera. And last but not least, Send server. As part of Universal, you get per socket send server uh, licensing for your Citrix workloads. So uh, feel free to, again to consolidate those workloads into send server if required. Awesome. Thanks for covering all of those changes. We've been working with customers on this transition, and along the way, we've heard a few questions. So one of those questions is cool. How do I know what licensing I need next? Robert, do you want to talk about how you help our customers answer this question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Citrix, refocusing on the hybrid model, uh, it going private, and then switching to subscription services uh, for its entire license suite. We do get asked this a lot, right? Customers coming to us and say, based on licensing I have now, where do I go next? Uh, most customers today uh, that are coming up for renewal, they're on perpetual licensing. They purchase those directly from Citrix. They've got a Citrix environment in-house and they're asking, what do we do next? So public cloud support for perpetual licensing ends with CVAD 1912, which is just a couple months away. So there's definitely a need to transition off of that product. And where do we go next? Uh, there was some confusion uh, with several of our customers wondering if the latest CVAD versions, either 2203 or 2402, do those still support public cloud? And answer to that is yes. If you switch your licensing up to Citrix Universal, like we're discussing today, you can absolutely run on-premise CVAD and still access public cloud resources up in Microsoft Azure specifically. Uh, that tends to be the data prize preferred partner uh, for those workloads. Today, if you have Citrix DAS or Citrix DAS with hybrid rights and you're coming up for renewal, you will need to transition to Citrix Universal Licensing to maintain desktop as a service. Uh, so that is the Citrix Cloud offering. And for anybody with a CVAD term subscription, this is uh, kind of an interim license. We don't see a lot of those out there, uh, but there were CVAD based on term licenses. If you have those today, uh, your public cloud resources will still work uh, with CVAD 2402 until that license is up for renewal. Uh, when that license comes up for renewal, if you're leveraging those public cloud features, you will need to move to Citrix Universal Licensing. If you're not using public cloud features and you have no need to do that, uh, one of the other licenses that Citrix offers is called Citrix for Private Cloud. Again, it's a subscription service, uh, does not have a public cloud feature set, but still runs on the new CVAD versions, either 2203 or 2402. Awesome. And one question here, it sounds like you've been answering, um, but just to put a finer point on it, do we lose public cloud resource availability if upgrade? Robert, do you want to answer this one for us as well? Sure. So now it becomes down to licensing. Um, so if I have a perpetual license and I upgrade uh, to a later LTSR release, like a 2402, uh, then yes, you would lose public cloud functionality. You need to transition that to a, a DAS license or a Citrix Universal license uh, to maintain that public cloud capability. Uh, the two CVAD versions that are out there right now, 2203 and 2402, um, if, if you're upgrading anyway, we would recommend going to the latest version, 2402. Um, Citrix DAS, which is a feature of Citrix Universal, can host things on-premise or public cloud. Awesome. 
So um, let's move into our next section here where we're going to be talking about some new and some revamped Citrix features. And JP will be showing us some cool demos from the platform. So I'm going to make a quick presenter change here and let JP take the rein so he can talk us through these. Absolutely. Let me turn off my camera for a little bit just to make sure my bandwidth behaves properly. And let me go ahead and share my screen. And please let me know if you're seeing my PowerPoint presentation. I'm seeing it. All right. Awesome. So the way we'll do this, I, I like to dis, uh, do this a little interactive. So uh, we're going to go through a, a PowerPoint slide just to cover a few um, of the features and then uh, we'll get into uh, the actual demo of those features. So the first uh, point I wanted to touch on is advanced login and security. And this is paramount for many, many, many customers. Uh, most of uh, customers required some sort of multi-factor authentication. Some of them even required that uh, authentication to adapt to the context of the device or their connection. Uh, some of them required conditional authentication based on those uh, context changes. And uh, they need to change how the session behaves based on the device being trusted or untrusted. So the way we manage this is through our device posture service and adaptive authentication services. And I want to I want to point that these features are available. They are all GA and DataPrice is ready to support you in your transition to adopt these features. So the first demo that I wanted to show you is the adaptive authentication service, but with an untrusted logon. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to Citrix Workspace this is going to redirect me to an adaptive authentication instance that Citrix manages for DataPrize, and I'm just entering my username. This is going to uh, perform an endpoint analysis a scan of my own endpoint. And after the scan, it determines I'm not a trusted user. It determines that I'm missing either some software, some certificates. Uh, you can get super granular about this. And this is why I'm required to enter both my password and a token. After I log on, now, this is uh, the actual uh, workspace uh, screen. I get access to uh, my uh, desktops and my applications. And I wanted to show you, this is what I will use to determine whether my uh, device is uh, trusted or not. There's a file that the endpoint analysis, analysis is looking for uh, to determine that. And again, you can get super granular uh, antivirus, workspace app uh, version, certain certificates, registry keys, et cetera. Now on the next part, I'm going to simulate a trusted user logon. And as you see, it's gonna be very similar. I'm going to go to democloud.cloud.com. And this is going to ask me for my username one more time. And after I enter my username, the endpoint analysis scan will be run. Now this time, because my device is compliant with the requirements for endpoint analysis, it's only asking me for my password. So this is the magic of adaptive authentication. Based on how the device is configured, it's gonna let the system determine whether I'm a trusted user or not and adapt the authentication requirements to that. So now that I'm logging in, something you'll notice is that I actually have access to more desktops than I, uh, I had before. And this is the file that I'm using to determine that the device is trusted. Of course, this is just a text file. It could be easily replicated, but then again, going back to my previous point, just to show you that you can get super granular, analyze that endpoint, and after analyzing it, that's what, what you can use to determine um, if the user is trusted or not. Now, we also support several workloads. You saw when I logged in as an untrusted user, I had a subset of desktops, and I when I logged on as a trusted user, I even had more desktops. And these desktops can come from different places, whether it is on-premises or public cloud. As you know, we are the only true hybrid DAS provider that supports workloads coming from a public cloud and uh, from a uh, on-prem hypervisor. And this can be all type of workloads, right? So hosted shared desktops where several users are sharing the same desktop, pool desktops, personal desktops assigned to a specific user, uh, the VM hosted applications or seamless applications to make it appear as if they were running on the local endpoint, and then remote PC access. And remote PC access, I just wanted to give this a uh, quick announcement. We just released remote PC access for Mac OS with the Mac OS VDA a couple of weeks ago, and this is on GA. 
And with this, we're seeing partners more and more deliver uh, Mac-based workloads from Mac uh, uh, endpoints to their end customers. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you have a requirement to access a Mac endpoint, we're able to um, provide this access with remote PC access now. And what I, what I wanted to show you through this part of the demo is this uh, uh, hybrid workload support, right? So here I'm on my home screen. I have access to a different set of applications and desktops, but I wanted to switch to the apps view. And here I have access to uh, some uh, web applications that are part of uh, secure private access, which is beyond the scope of our demo today. But I also have uh, access to some desktop applications coming from uh, the server side and DAS. Here, I'm just gonna launch Excel, of course. Uh, I believe most of us are used to the user experience here. We just launched the application. This is the actual uh, app. I'm running uh, my demo from a Mac, but this is actually the Windows version of the application, and I'm just gonna exit it real quick. Then I'm uh, switching to the desktops session, and here what I wanted to show you is the different desktops that I have access to, right? So as you see, I have some coming from AWS, Azure, Azure in a different location. And I'm just launching a AWS based desktop here just to quickly show you the user experience. Uh, I'm gonna exit this one. There's not a lot of interaction going to happen at this point yet. And after I disconnect from this session, I'm going to launch another desktop and this one is coming from, from Azure. And what I wanted to show you here is that regardless where the workload is hosted, whether it is on-prem, Azure, AWS, or GCP, the user experience is pretty much the same. They will see a desktop that they will interact with and work with and complete their work tasks, uh, tasks with. Uh, but to them, the underlying hosting environment is pretty much it's pretty much seamless. They don't they don't have to worry or care, up, care about that. And as you see, we have desktops coming from Australia, Europe. Uh, GCP and even on-prem based desktops. And uh, I will show you the difference in performance between these desktops uh, in, in an upcoming section of the demo, which I think it's, it's really cool. It gets me very excited. Now, next one is security. Of course, we know security is super important. If you're talking about uh, uh, verticalized markets like uh, healthcare or finance, maybe you need tailored Citrix policies. You need to be super granular about what a trusted user can do as opposed to an untrusted user. Maybe you need to provide a screen capture protection or even record what the users are doing to protect your data. So via session recording, adaptive access, and app protection, we can provide this to you. So uh, the first thing I wanted to show you is how Citrix policies behave for an untrusted user. So here I am logged in again as an untrusted user, and I'm just going to launch this Azure desktop. And I just want you to catch two things from this Azure desktop. The first thing is that there's a watermark that says who I am and the name of the VDA. And as you can see here, I am, I am unable to access my local endpoints drives, right? So then again, I'm an untrusted user. Uh, the endpoint analysis has has uh, shown that uh, I'm missing something in my computer. So the um, uh, system uh, takes the decision to say, hey, you're limited as far as how you can interact with the session. So this is why I have this watermark and this is why I am unable to interact with the local resources on the machine I'm, I'm working from. Now I'm going to do the same but from a uh, trusted user perspective. So from a trusted user perspective, this is the same user, it's the same, uh, um, same user uh, account, and I'm gonna launch this same desktop. Now, what you will see is that this looks different. First of all, I don't have the watermark, right? Now, if I open the Windows Explorer, you will notice that now I am being asked if I want to interact with the files on my local endpoint. I'm gonna say yes, and then I'm given access to the local disks on my actual endpoint I'm connecting from. So this is how granular you can get with policies in order to determine, hey, you're a trusted user, you can do more, you can interact better, interact easier, but hey, if you're untrusted, I, I don't want you to have access to my data, the important files from my customers, so this is why I want to lock the environment a little bit. Now, the next one is Citrix App Protection, and Citrix App Protection is, is great, and, and again, we have a lot of customers using this, uh, especially on the finance and healthcare uh, verticals, because they're dealing with a lot of super uh, important data that they want to protect. So uh, with App Protection, what we're doing is actually we're uh, enabling technology to protect from screen capturing, so that if someone try, tries to take a screenshot from the environment, 
then uh, they're not going to be able to exfiltrate the data. So here I'm uh, launching uh, the employee desktop, which is uh, app protection enabled. And as soon as this launches, and this is from the trusted user experience, by the way. So I'm a trusted user. I'm, uh, I'm able to, to log in uh, as a trusted user. So here I'm able to see the data. I'm able to take a screen capture if I want it. This uh, means that uh, the adaptive access technology has determined that um, the uh, endpoint I'm connecting from is trusted. It has the antivirus, the policies, the backup technology to trust me from taking screenshots. But then I'm going to log out. And then I'm going to modify that file I uh, showed you at the uh, previous demo. And I'm just going to change its name so that the endpoint analysis fails. So I'm just going to make it fail on purpose and simulate an untrusted um, user logon. This is going to perform the endpoint analysis. And then this is going to ask me for my password and my token, of course, because it, it recognized me as an untrusted user. When I go to desktops, you will see some desktops disappear because, again, if I'm untrusted, I might not have access to all of the desktops and applications. But now let's take a look at what the experience is when I launch the desktop. So let's launch this uh, employee desktop. Again, same user. And as you see, this went blank. And the reason why this went blank right away is because I'm using uh, recording software to record this demo. So uh, app protection detected that I was using this recording software and it blanked out everything. If I was a normal user without that, that, without that recording software, I would see my screen. But when I try to take the, the, the screenshot with the snipping tool, that's where I would see the gray screen uh, and app protection protecting my data. Uh, so this is how app protection works to protect your data from exfiltration. And then last but not least on the security side is uh, session recording. And once again, session recording uh, from the user perspective, it's uh, it's really seamless. There's really not a lot happening. But as you know, uh, maybe for monitoring re uh, um, uh, reasons, maybe for qu quality assurance, maybe data protection, you might want to know what the users are doing uh, when they interact with, the des with their desktops and applications. So what session recording does is that it actually records all of the session. So from the user perspective, it's really simple. They will just log into the desktop and they will see this message saying, hey, everything you're doing is being recorded. Be careful with what you do because we're gonna know. And then from the admin perspective, this would be data price as your service provider. They would be able to take a look at the session recording console and see what this user was doing, right? So again, it's pretty simple very uh very uh, seamless for the end user non disruptive at all but it gives you a lot of possibilities and it opens up a lot of security features for you now i'm going into the last part of my demo but this is definitely my favorite i'm super excited about this because of everything that i did in this part uh so uh this is about availability right so first of all as you know citrix das runs with the gateway service the gateway service is a turnkey service that we created to avoid uh, providers like Dataprice and customers like yourself from having to deploy your own Netscaler for gateway purposes. This means that we manage this service for you and we give you multiple points of presence around the world to service those connections into your, um, into your resources. So this gives you a lot of availability and it also brings a lot of protection because we have created something that is called service continuity and service continuity brings the technology for you to be able to work even under outage um, uh, outage scenarios where uh, you might, or you, the endpoint might not be able to um, contact Citrix Cloud. There might be a DNS issue at your ISP level that's not related to Citrix Cloud at all. Several reasons. So let's get into the demo. And in this first part, I wanted, I wanted to show you HDX session performance. And I'm super proud about this. And the, the first thing I wanted to show you is that I recorded this from my home in Costa Rica. So I'm 2,500 miles away from our Azure resources in the in the US. And uh, I'm going to launch a, uh, I'm, I'm also going to launch a terminal session. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because I wanted to show you the gateway uh, point of presence I'm connecting to. So this is the global uh, publicly available IP address for the gateway service. And as you can see in the results, I'm in the Azure US South central region so that's the closest gateway pop 
that I'm connecting to. I'm in Costa Rica. There's not a gateway uh, pub in my country. The closest one is in uh, South, South Central US. I believe that's somewhere around uh, Texas. Uh, and that's where I'm connecting from, right? So again, 2,500 miles from my endpoint into the resources. Now, the next thing, thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to launch a desktop. I want you to see how this session behaves. Um, and the first thing I wanted to show you is latency, right? Because this is one of the most common questions we get. How good is the gateway service when handling latency? And I think it's pretty good. So when taking a look at the latency, this is just only 95 milliseconds for a connection over 2,500 miles. So this is pretty impressive in my opinion. If I uh, come into the actual um, workspace app, I will see the same latency uh, number around 94, 95 milliseconds, which is uh, with, what, which we consider a, a good connection, super acceptable for 90, 95% of the use cases. Yeah, you might find an isolated use case with 3D apps there that uh, where you might require uh, uh, a, a lower um, latency, but for the most part, this is this is really good. Now, the next one, this is an on-prem uh, desktop in Florida, and I also wanted to show you the same, right? That regardless, this is uh, of this being in the cloud and in Texas, and now this being in uh, an on-prem data center in Florida, the latency it's very similar. It's more dependent on the distant uh, distance of the connection. And as you can see, they're both showing this is a very good stable connection that's going to let me uh, work perfectly for everything I do. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to start interacting here with the desktop. Just open up a, a couple of things just so, you, so that you see mostly the refresh rates. That's what I want to, to see, how fast it refreshes, uh, how fast uh, the um, um, Windows um, Explorer is launched, how fast Outlook is launched, how fast it changes through the different screens. So this is really fast for me as a user connecting from 2,500 miles. I think this is really acceptable and it feels like if I, would, I was using a local endpoint. Now, last but definitely not least, the next one I wanted to show you is service continuity. And for this, I switched from my Mac computer to my Windows uh, VM that I created just for this. And the reason why I wanted to show you this uh, is because I'm going to simulate an outage. I just didn't want to do that on my on my Mac. So what I do, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm logging in as a typical user from my Workspace app. Once again, this works on both Mac and Windows, and this works on both uh, Workspace app client and uh, uh, browser-based um, sessions. Here I'm logging in. I changed the uh, authentication to Okta for this specific part of the demo. So I'm logging in through um, through Okta, through the same uh, demo cloud environment. Let me grab my password real quick there, and I'm just going to sign in. Now I want you to pay attention to the bottom left, uh, to this folder I, uh, that, that is called connection leases. And as you will see, something will start popping up again. All right, let's just give it a quick second. And here we have the first pop-up. Let's enter this folder. Let's enter uh, the folder again. And finally, the leases file. So this is the technology used by service continuity. So with service continuity, what we're doing is we're creating lease files that represent the virtual apps and desktops that you have access to in your environment so that you can access them uh, when you're in an outage. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm modifying the host file in my computer so I'm pointing democloud.cloud.com to my loopback address, meaning a local address that has nothing to do with the real IP address of DemoCloud. Now let me go ahead and exit the Workspace app, right? So let me go ahead and reopen Workspace app one more time. And now you will notice something a little different here. All right, let me pin it to the side. And you will notice that some uh, some resources are grayed out. This is because those are part of secure private access, which is outside of the scope. As you see, Workspace app says, we're unable to connect to some of your resources. Some virtual apps and desktops may still be available. This means we're working on outage mode. What I'm going he doing here is I'm going to launch a resource. And this resource, due to the nature of the outage, it's going to ask me for my username and password. This is nor not normal operations. However, this is required when working on their outage mode. But anyway, what I wanted to show you is that even though I'm unable to access democloud.cloud.com, 
I'm still able to launch my resources. And that's because the gateway services is, is available and uh, because the lease files have been created. And what I'm doing here, I just wanted to show you, be transparent about it. Democloud.cloud.com is pointing to my loopback address. So there's really no trick here. It, it works that easy. It's just the click of a button. Uh, and then what I wanted to show you as well on the Workspace app side is for you to see what the Workspace app looks like on the endpoint. And here it's gonna show you that the connection leasing is the technology being used right now uh, to connect, meaning outage mode, and we're connecting through the gateway service. I always tell my partners for the gateway service to go uh, down and fail, that's really difficult. It pretty much means that GCP, AWS, and Azure need to fail at the same time and at multiple regions at the same time again, just because of how many points of presence we have there. So it's a very robust uh, service. And we trust that this brings a lot of um, uh, functionality that it's going to solve your uh, availability requirements. So uh, that's it. That's the part of uh, my demo. And I'll bring it back to Stephanie for the rest of the presentation. Awesome. Thanks, JP. I'm going to go ahead and bring the screen sharing back to my end there. Uh, you really wrote, were telling the truth when you said you saved one of the most exciting things for last. That is pretty cool there, that service continuity feature. Um, so with that, uh, let's address a few more common questions we get about Citrix, one that may be sparked um, by some of the demos you just covered. So first, if I move to DAS, do I have to pay for the Citrix Gateway service too? Robert, I know some customers probably wondering this after what we just saw from JP, uh, eager to get that Gateway service. Can you shed some light on this for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the Gateway service is bundled totally with Citrix DAS, which is included uh, with universal licensing for Citrix. Uh, so no, there's no need to purchase that, that service separately. It's already included with Citrix Universal. Awesome. I love when the answer is simple and easy. <laughs> and another question here, which I'll throw to you, JP, um, can Citrix deliver on some increased performance and reliability needs? Yes, absolutely. So when we're talking about increasing performance, data price can definitely help you out using our technology to make it better for you. First of all, talking about workspace environment management, we have documented use cases uh, for uh, customers and partners alike, seeing an increase in between 50 and 65% performance when using uh, workspace environment manager, as opposed to when you're not using it. So yes, optimizing the RAM and CPU uh, will help you um, host more users per virtual machine or uh, will al allow you to allocate um, fewer resources to a, a separate virtual machine for each end user. On the other hand, not only does this uh, increase the user scalability, but you're also able to use autoscale to reduce the cost of your environment. So if you're talking about uh, public cloud, you know resource consumption is based on when these machines are available, whether they're consuming CPU or RAM. And if you don't need them right away, why should they, they be uh, consuming resources? So autoscale will help you uh, bring in better uh, scalability and user density uh, while ensuring your cost is driven down. Awesome. So Citrix has a ton of game changing features to offer, a few of which we got to take a look at today, which was awesome. If you'd like to explore any of these features, whether you're new to Citrix, or already have a Citrix environment and want to make sure you're getting the best use out of it, uh, we can help you there. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Scott to cover some more of the specifics on how we help our customers make the most of those Citrix investments. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. So, DataPrize, we offer full-fledged 360-degree, you know, aspect and support here. Um, Robert and JB have talked about the new licensing that's out there with Citrix right now. We're working with all of our current clients as well as many new clients at this point to figure out what the best next steps are and approach for them, including, you know, a new design uh, and implementation. And then after that, we can also provide uh, a managed services overlay where we you know, monitor, manage, and maintain that environment. So you go live either with an updated new design or a brand new deployment, uh, and then we can help you uh, keep that environment running in tip-top shape, right? So uh, after the setup, you know, we will continue helping with desktop provisioning. Uh, we'll be monitoring for performance, optimization, 
uh, and then uh, also apply uh, not only operating system updates for your virtual machines, but your applications that you're publishing. If you're also publishing apps to your end users, uh, including OS updates based on Microsoft schedule, for instance, as well as your Citrix environments updates uh, for critical and security patches, uh, you know, through cumulative updates that Citrix releases for, uh, you know, the, the desktop and application infrastructure components themselves. <clears throat> In addition to that, on the next slide, we also will provide the same level of services for uh, Netscaler. So if you have uh, Netscaler, and most, most folks will, um, if they don't have a gateway service, they may have a Netscaler as well. When you load balancing and some of these security aspects that JP covered so well in his demo, um, but those appliances are uh, they're critical to uh, the, the overall security of the environment, and uh, they are fairly complex appliances. We provide the same managed services on top of that with proactive monitoring, managing and maintaining that, whether it's load balancing, whether it's your SSL offloading, whether it's your security settings. Uh, as well as ongoing critical and security updates and cumulative updates as they are released. So the goal here is, you know, let Dataprice handle the mundane administrative tasks associated with keeping your environment up and running so you can focus on, you know, what you know best about your business and your core functionalities. So be sure to talk to us about that as well um, if we help you with migrating your licensing uh, to the new Citrix. Uh, license model and happy to work with you. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Those are some great takeaways. And I'll finish here with a few takeaways of my own. First, make sure you know what is happening with your Citrix licensing. Because as we saw, it's changing and there may be some intricacies in there that you don't know about. You may getting availability to tools that you don't know you could use to make more use of those investments, all of those things. Um, second, there's so many exciting and game-changing features you can take advantage of to, again, increase that return on your Citrix investment. And if you need help with either of those steps, figuring out your licensing or figuring out how to make the most use of those Citrix investments, you are already right now talking to an experienced partner that can help you accomplish these goals. Please do let us know if you need that assistance. We are happy to help. So that brings us to the end of our session today. And we're gonna finish off here with just a few minutes for Q&A and then we'll be able to get everybody out just a few minutes early. So let me pop in here to the Q&A section and see what I can find. All right, first we have up here, um, JP, this is probably a good fit for you. Um, what's on the long-term roadmap for Citrix and how does the new licensing model and some of these new features fit into that overall strategy? Awesome, so we have a lot of things going on uh, when it comes uh, to a product development uh, perspective. Uh, as I mentioned before, part of the uh, benefits of uh, being taken private and being becoming a part of cloud software group is that our development has accelerated and has been actually tailored and aligned with our real customer needs so we're seeing improvements from several different angles like authentication with uh, conditional authentication for example or improvements uh, to the hdx protocol or for more on the service provider side a uh, more granularity to have multiple tenants so on the overall strategy everything is very well aligned because our product is uh finally being handled uh in a way that is more aligned to what the partners and customers really need uh as opposed to a marketing trend or something that doesn't really align to to what our customers need so the future is really bright mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, here's another one for you. Uh, is there any worry about performance issues when implementing some new fit Citrix features like the ones demoed today? Um, not really. Uh, actually, um, it, performance will get better uh, by some of those uh, features. Uh, as, as you show, you know, gateway service, the performance is great uh, across different, different um, geos in the world. Then uh, from a workload availability perspective, um, also, having something like service continuity will make sure your performance is uh, always, uh, uh, you know, up to par, and that your resources are always available. And if you want to throw in something additional there, 
in some like workspace environment manager with that CPU and RAM optimization, you actually get to leverage your resources in a better way so that your end users uh, experience is better. So if anything, adding more of those features, our protocol is designed to increase the user experience and make it uh, better from a performance side. Awesome. All right, another one here. How long can the service continuity feature maintain productivity during an outage? So that one is uh, pretty much as long as the user doesn't log off completely from the Workspace app. There are certain um, um, outage scenarios that work, uh, service continuity can cover. So if you're like what I showed you before, by any reason something happens and your workspace is not available and workspace app cannot reach to the workspace app, as long as the user doesn't log off and those lease files are available in the computer, that's going to be uh, that's going to be accessible. Now on the other hand, there's a quick setting that you can set up, and that's the lifetime for those lease files on the workspace app. So if you only configure them for 24 hours, let's say that's how long they will exist. So um, mm. that's this is where you can use uh, data price expertise so that uh, they can uh, guide you about uh, setting that up correctly so that if you see that a, a, a outage might affect your environment for any given reason, you have enough time to access the resources even in outage mode. Definitely, that's a great tip there. Um, another one here, what are the storage requirements for the in-session recording feature? Um, in session recording feature. So um, this is managed as a service in Citrix Cloud. You do need uh, to have some uh, a specific uh, storage. Uh, I don't have them on top of my mind. However, go ahead and contact the data price team and we'll get you that information right away uh, in order to uh, get the recordings into, into session recording. Do you keep in mind though, again, session recording used to be managed as a completely uh, uh, managed uh, infrastructure resource in uh, your environment, but nowadays it had also been ha has also been sent to or created as a cloud service. So everything is managed there in Citrix Cloud. Awesome, JP. Thank you so much for thinking on your toes here to answer all these questions. That is about all we have time for today. If we didn't get to your question, uh, we will follow up afterwards with you via email. We have all of those recorded and we'll make sure you get that information. With that, I will say thank you to our speakers. Thank you, JP, Scott, Robert. We really appreciate having the experts on with us to lend your knowledge to this session. Um, for everybody who joined with us, we hope you learned something new and we hope to see you on the next one. Thank you.